Welcome, dear viewer. I hope you are having a wonderful night. Tonight, I'll be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. I hope you are warm and ready. Let's begin. I know that this sounds like the kind of advice for anyone left alone in the house at night, but this is different. It started a week ago. I was in bed. It had just turned one. Zero. I was scrolling on my phone while my wife Steph was asleep. I suddenly had a notification pop up at the top of my phone. Anyone with a video doorbell will be accustomed to this. Motion detected. I normally ignore it, as it was either a car coming down the road or a person stumbling back home after a night out. Then the doorbell chimed and the notification followed. I opened the app, and sure enough, there was a young woman standing, clinging onto my doorframe. I answered, hello, can I help you? And she came back immediately. Please let me in, someone is chasing me. I told her to stay where she was, and I would call the police. I heard her again. Please let me in, he's going to hurt me. Please hurry. At this point, my wife woke up and asked me what I was doing. As I put some clothes on, ready to go downstairs, I said there was a woman at our door begging to come in as someone was chasing her. I was about to dial for the police when Stephanie opened the app. She said, babe, no one is there. We looked back on the motion history. Both notifications were logged. I opened the first one, nothing but our front porch. I proceeded to the other notification where someone had pressed the doorbell. There was my front porch, shrouded in darkness, but this time we could hear only my voice. Of course, there was no response to my questions. I thought to myself, was I going crazy? My wife said it was late. I must have been half asleep and my mind was playing tricks on me. Even if that was right, it still didn't explain why we got the notifications. The next night, we both sat binge watching a Netflix show in our living room. We must have lost track of time, as it was nearly one in the morning. I went to check if the back door was locked when my phone buzzed. I asked Steve whether she had the same. She had. I opened the app just as it notified me that someone had pressed the bell. We both quickly opened the live view. A child stood at our door. The young boy must have been no older than eight. The camera was in night vision, which was black and white. The boy's face glowed his eyes piercing through my screen. I once again answered, hello, can I help? The kid looked up at the camera and said, hi, my dad broke down just up the road and his phone is dead. Can you please let me in? I need to use your phone. Me and Steve looked at each other and she shook her head at me. I replied to him, I can call someone out for you or maybe the police can help. The boy then seemed to turn. His voice now had anger to it. Open the door. I need help. Are you really going to let me stay out here all alone? His story had changed. I went back after swallowing my own fear and said, stay there. I will get help. This time, I called the police. And they came around 20 minutes later. By this point, no one was around. We had seen the boy walk off around the corner five minutes after I had gotten off the phone. The officers checked our road and the surrounding area. They found no people, not even the odd car driving around. We both tried to show them the app, but obviously there was nothing there. The two officers were understanding and seemed to believe us. They gave us the department's direct number and told us to call them if anything happens again. We went to bed that night, scared and confused. We didn't understand what or why this was happening to us. The next day, we decided to get an early night. We made sure everything was locked and the house was secure. We both fell asleep early. I was woken up at just one, zero to the sound of two sets of buzzing from my phone. I ignored these. I just rolled over and went back to sleep. When I looked at my phone in the morning, I opened up the doorbell app. The video playback showed nothing, but I could hear scratching for about two, three seconds after the apparent press of the bell. I went downstairs and checked the door. Three sets of four deep scratches went down my front door. The anxiety hit me like a tidal wave going throughout my body. I now feared the night ahead of us. Two nights ago, 
We both decided to stay up. We were going to put an end to this. We were on edge in our own home, and it just wasn't right. The minutes drew closer to that damn time of one. Zero. Then, right on schedule, the notification started. I opened the app, and now there was one of the policemen. He was one of the officers who was with us the other night. I thought it was strange. It caught me off guard. Steve said that she would look out the window upstairs. We had both said earlier that one of us would look out the window to confirm if someone really was there. I answered the door. Hello, officer. Can I help you? He looked into the camera and said, we have an update on a problem you have been having. Can you please open the door? I felt a sense of conflict come over me. This didn't feel right. I had watched enough police programs and dramas to know they usually have to report to places with another officer. The lack of police cars also unnerved me. Sorry, officer. I'm sure you can understand the reluctance to open the door due to our situation. He snapped back. It's fine. I am an officer of the law and am instructing you to please open up. I need to come in and update you. Now I knew something was wrong. His whole demeanor was now completely different from when we spoke two nights ago. I watched as his head looked upwards. I heard my wife scream the words, oh my God, his eyes, what the fuck? I rushed up the stairs, my feet slipping as I ran. I saw Steve, but she looked petrified. She stared at me blankly and said, she stared at me blankly and said, you need to let him in. He will help us. I uttered back, struggling to catch my breath. We can't. You know we can't. What did you see? What was wrong with his eyes? She tilted her head at me. Her eyes began to roll upwards. Let him in. Her tone started to change. It was turning into a gravelly, rasping voice. Her face was now full of anger as she screamed at me. Let him in now. I grabbed her and shook her while shouting Steve. Listen to me. Snap out of it. She looked back at me, dazed and confused. She said wearily, with tears in her eyes, I want to go to bed. I said only if you are okay. She said she was fine and didn't know what happened. I checked the video feed once more, and no one was there. It took me a few hours to fall asleep, worrying about what happened to Steve. When I woke the next morning, Steve was gone. Her phone and jewelry were left on the bedside cabinet. I went downstairs and searched for her, but nothing. She wasn't in the house. I called the police department at the number I was given, and I spoke to the partner of the policeman that was at my door. I told him everything that happened and that my wife had gone missing. They told me the officer who stood at my door eight hours earlier was on leave. He flew out on holiday yesterday morning. It couldn't have been him. In the hours ahead, a search team was assembled, and I joined them in searching the local area. There was no sign of her. It's now 11 p.m., and I'm sitting alone in my living room, my head now full of fear and radiating pain. I just want my stepmother home. I just want normality back. Here it comes. Zero. Fifty-nine. Three. Two. One. Zero. The notifications came through, and I opened the app. Steve was at the front door. I was almost half expecting it. I said, where were you, honey? She looked into the camera and said, I was taken, but I escaped. And I'm here now. Let me in, and I will tell you all about it. I took a deep sigh. Okay, I will be there in a minute, babe. What can I do? She is my wife. I have nothing without her. I wrote all of this throughout this evening, hoping for some sort of closure. Maybe even a happy ending to this horrible experience. I guess now it will just be a piece of evidence about what happened to us both. I need to go answer the door now. My wife is home. Hey there, strangers. My name is Allie. I'm the owner of a small diner tucked away in a town somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. The diner doesn't really get much action aside from townsfolk and the occasional out of towner passing through and looking for a hot meal. And when those folk happen to come by, I like to introduce myself. 
bring them their food, and then sit down with them and explain a little game I like to play to pass the time out here. For some context, I inherited this diner from my parents and have spent practically my whole life in this town, aside from the rare trips to nearby events, markets, state fairs, etc. But those are really only reserved for special occasions, and I don't mind that. I enjoy the peace and quiet that comes with my lifestyle, and I can't deny that. As far as lives go, I happen to have myself a pretty good one. I have wonderful friends, the sweetest husband, and a beautiful baby girl named Kate. But as nice as my life is to me, I can't deny that it's also really slow. Not many big things have happened to me, if you'll understand what I'm saying. And so whenever an unknown face walks into my diner, I ask them if they have any stories to tell me. And if they do, I'm always more than happy to give them a discount on their meal. I've been doing this since I was 22, so about 10 years now. Okay. I'm going to admit something a bit embarrassing to you all. The reason I had when I first started to do this was that I had recently found out about the notion of cryptids, and I thought the concept was pretty damn cool. More specifically, I thought people viewing me as a cryptid would be pretty damn cool. You know, some girl in some diner in the middle of nowhere that you end up spilling your darkest secrets to, and then never see again. Wouldn't that be a neat way to be perceived? Well, my spooky little young adult self thought so, and that's where it all began. Normally, people are quite hesitant to talk at first. However, they tend to warm up to the idea after I remind them that not only will we likely never cross paths again, but I don't care about what kind of story they tell me. Whatever they feel like talking about, I'll listen to. I just want a break from the monotony of small town life. And boy, have I heard it all. Love affairs, childhood traumas, batshit deathbed confessions heard by nurses, the story of a very intoxicating and very hush, hush two month relationship a customer had with another woman in college before she tragically passed in an accident that she's never told a soul about. Since, especially not her very Catholic now, husband. But besides all that jazz, there's one type of story I keep being told. Horror. Now I get why this is. Ghost stories. Supernatural shit. Whatever you want to call it. That's the kind of thing people are hesitant to talk about. And in my opinion, half of it is because that's the kind of thing people are hesitant to believe. But who cares if you tell it to me? You're not going to see me again. So what's the harm in finally telling someone? It wouldn't matter if I didn't believe them. They'd still get the discount. But I do believe the stories people tell me. It's something in their eyes, I think. When I look into them, I can see they're being haunted by something awful. And I think it helps them to talk about it. To leave here with the knowledge they're not carrying that burden alone. And carrying it with them is something I'm thankful I get to do. I listen to their stories bring them sweet tea and dessert to cheer them up afterwards, and I'll hold their hands if they'll let me. Just generally, I try to help them. It's one small way I can make an impact on some people who are really hurting by being the kind stranger they can confide in, knowing that they'll be believed. But anyways, I've told my husband some of these stories over the years, and he recently started browsing this subreddit, and mentioned to me that I should think about sharing some of them with y'all. And so here I am, sitting in my comfy chair after my baby girl finally fell asleep with my laptop and my absolutely darling cat cinnamon. I really do hope you guys enjoy the story I decided to share today, and I'll probably post some more soon. It was about five years ago now. I think this happened sometime in early July, so it was just after my 27th birthday. A young woman stumbled into the diner. I'd guess she was maybe a few years younger than I was. 23, maybe. Well, the poor thing looked like she hadn't properly slept in weeks. And with eye bags so dark, I had to take a moment to figure out if they were actually black eyes. She sat down at a booth, and I came over to pour her some coffee, which she gratefully accepted. I took her order, waffles with powdered sugar and a side of mixed fruit, and moved to sit down across from her. 
Instead of asking if she had stories to tell, I decided to ask her if she was all right, as the way her eyes shifted around the room and the way her hands trembled so violently as she tried to use the cutlery made me nervous that she was in some sort of danger. She looked at me and her eyes began to water and in the softest voice you could ever imagine, she just told me that I wouldn't believe her. It was here that I explained some of the parts of my game, focusing on the fact that there's really no harm in talking about it if she wanted to. Our paths would probably never cross again. I remember the way she looked down at the table as her hands moved to scratch quite violently at the skin on her arms, which were just covered in long red marks already. My heart absolutely ached at the sight, but I decided not to say anything for the time being, though it took everything in me not to reach over and take her hands away and hold them myself. Finally, she sighed and met my gaze as she nodded ever so slightly at me. She told me she had a stalker, and not one she thought was human. The first time she saw him was a few months prior, when she was walking to her dorm alone one night, back when she lived right by the Appalachian Mountains. She had gone out with some friends and didn't realize how late it had gotten. And by the time she had started to make her way home, it was nearly two in the morning. The fastest way to get home meant she had to use a small path that cut through the woods. And she told me she was too worried about the big test she had to get home to study for to really think about the dangers of walking through there at night. As she walked, she said she got that awful feeling that she was being watched. And out of nowhere, she was hit with this horrific wave of anxiety. Her heart began to race like a scampering jackrabbit, and she broke into a cold sweat. And then she noticed it watching her through the tree line. It was tall and vaguely man-shaped. Although she said she would hesitate to call it that, and by tall, she meant inhumanly tall, roughly seven or so feet, by her guess. Its skin was sickly pale, and its eyes were bloodshot, accompanied by an impossibly wide grin that revealed way too many horribly stained teeth. From what she could see, the thing was completely hairless and dressed in camouflage, type clothing, the kind that hunters and the military wear. She said that she froze up when she saw it, staring at the thing in absolute horror. And it just stayed there, smiling at her. Eventually, she snapped out of it and bolted, yet the thing made no move to follow her. All it did was turn to face her and continue to smile as she ran off. She told me that when she got back to her dorm, she just got this sudden urge that she was going to be sick. And this was super weird, since the girl had only thrown up twice in her life. Once, when she got a really bad case of the flu when she was 10, and once, when she got a little too drunk at a party in high school. Yet she had spent the next 10 minutes throwing up everything in her stomach, and the next 20 dry, heaving over the toilet. Her roommate had rushed in to find her covered in sweat and violently sobbing, as she puked her guts out for no apparent reason. She had tried to tell her about the thing that she saw in the woods but her roommate had told her that she was probably just sick with something and that her mind was playing tricks on her. She said that night she had supposedly had these beyond horrible nightmares and her roommate told her the next morning she had woken up screaming four separate times. That was her first encounter with the thing, but it certainly wasn't the last. At this point, she had begun hyperventilating. Tears ran down her cheeks and a strangled cry retched itself from her throat. I quickly ran over to the counter to get her some napkins and a glass of water before I finally gave in, grasped her shaking hands, and held them tightly. I had asked her if she wanted to stop, but she just shook her head, and so I held her hands and waited for her to continue with her story. She said she realized pretty quickly that whatever it was came with the night. At first, she genuinely believed she had come down with some kind of awful virus. But when she woke up the next morning, shaken and exhausted, but by all other means healthy, she was very confused but didn't really know what else to do. She then emailed her professor to explain her situation and sat on her couch and watched episodes of her favorite show while apparently clung onto her roommate for dear life. That was until nightfall came around and she saw the thing again and this time it was watching her from her living room window. Instead of freezing up again, 
She just started to scream, and when her roommate rushed over to see what was wrong, she looked out the window and went pale as a ghost. She asked her roommate if she was seeing it too, and she just nodded before dragging her out of sight of the thing's view and calling the cops. Her symptoms immediately came back. The vomiting, the panic attack, like behavior, the sweating, all of it, just like the night before. For some reason though, her roommate was completely unaffected. Shaken, sure, but no sickness, no nightmares, nothing, just like the few other people after that who saw it when they were with her, although nobody ever saw it without her, and then the police showed up, and things got even worse. They couldn't brush her concerns off, even in the state she was in. Her perfectly healthy roommate had seen it too, and so they began to look into things, and what they found was absolutely nothing. The thing couldn't be seen on the security camera footage right beside where it had been standing. They couldn't find a record of any person matching its description in their databases. No matter how many times she called over the next three months, no matter the situation, no matter if there was another person there who insisted they saw it too, they couldn't find any evidence of it being there or any record of its existence. She went to a psychiatrist who determined she didn't seem to be suffering from any sort of psychotic disorder, and other doctors at the local hospital ran every test they possibly could to explain her symptoms. Head Keck scans, MRIs, they all came back totally clean. She had no head trauma, tumors, or any type of head injury that could be causing hallucinations. Her blood tests showed there was no autoimmune disease that could explain the symptoms. She did gastric emptying scans and other similar tests, which eventually confirmed there was no disorder that could explain the vomiting. The symptoms never happened during the day, during testing, or in any other situation. She never got sick or had any other type of nightmare or hallucination. She just kept seeing whatever the hell that thing was and getting violently ill. Eventually, she decided to just try her best to stay inside after dark which worked for a while until the night when everything went very wrong. She had gone to a local cafe to get some homework done and accidentally fell asleep at her computer. She woke up to one of the waitresses gently shaking her awake and telling her it was closing time. Their closing time. Their closing time was 10 p.m. The sun had set over an hour ago. Her hands started to shake more violently than they already were, which I didn't even think was possible and she choked back another sob before she continued to speak. She dug through her backpack to find her pocket knife and tucked it into her jacket sleeve before she began to brave her way through the darkness back to her house. The cafe was only a 10 minute walk with the shortcut, 20 if she stayed on the streets. She considered her options for a moment, trying to figure out which was more dangerous. She eventually decided that while the streets would take longer, they were better lit and maybe still had some people out. It wasn't that late, but this wasn't exactly a college town either. There wasn't exactly a nightlife besides one or two bars. The odds were that she could make the whole trip and run into less than a dozen people. She had made it 10 minutes before she got the feeling she got on the path again. The unmistakable feeling of being watched coupled with cold sweats and horrible anxiety. She slipped her knife out of her jacket into her hand and held it out in front of her as her gaze shifted to the nearby alleyway. And there it was, tall and pale as death, with the same bloodshot eyes and smile, with too many teeth, and that same damn camouflage outfit it always seemed to wear. Only this time, it also held something else, a bouquet of wilted flowers. As the thing held them out to her, she turned and bolted down the street all thought of defending herself from that thing long forgotten. This time though, it dropped the flowers and took off after her. And this was the first time she realized just how fast it actually was. She told me she had always been a good runner. She did track in high school and even made the state finals. And this was without a doubt the fastest she had ever run in her life. But this thing somehow caught up to her in a matter of seconds and then it reached out and grabbed her shoulder. At this, she took her hands away from mine and pulled down one of the sleeves of her yellow woolen cardigan, revealing her bare shoulder, and my breath caught in my throat. 
On her shoulder was a large scar resembling the shape of a hand, palm on the shoulder itself, the outline of long fingers marking the top of her arm. My first thought was about the time I was 17 years old and saw a story about a woman who had acid thrown on her face on TV. It looked almost like that, but if a person with inhumanly long hands somehow managed to cover their own hand in acid without injuring themselves and gripped her shoulder as hard as they possibly could, or maybe like a third degree burn in the shape of a hand, like if it were from a person who was made of pure fire. She sniffled softly, which pulled me out of my thoughts. In a whispered voice, she told me that the doctor said whatever burned her ate away the fat and a good portion of the muscle in that shoulder. She can barely lift that arm now. As the tears ran down her face, she talked about how the pain she felt in that moment was like nothing else she'd ever felt before. She couldn't even describe it. She remembered collapsing to the ground and screaming bloody murder, and right before she blacked out, she said she saw the thing lean over her, and with that horrible smile still on its face, it hissed out one word to her, soon. She woke up in the hospital two days later. Even after the wound healed, the pain never stopped and never got better, and that was it. That was the final straw for her. She withdrew from college packed up her things and moved to the States to live with her parents again. And for one week, things seemed to be okay. She thought maybe it didn't follow her here until a bouquet of the same wilted flowers in an empty chocolate box stuffed to the brim with bloody human teeth and fingernails appeared on her parents' doorstep. It got closer after that, becoming more and more cocky until the night when it actually knocked on her window banging on the glass with an almost maniacal frenzy until the police arrived. By that point, of course, there was nothing there. Not a trace. Since then, she's just been driving around the country. Her parents have been sending her money for food and motels. She figured that if it took a week to get from her old town to her parents' house and only seemed to come out at night, then maybe she could keep ahead of it if she just kept moving. After a moment of stunned silence, I asked if I could hug her and rushed over to pull the shaking girl into my arms as soon as I got a nod of approval. I spent the next half hour gently stroking her hair as she sobbed into my shirt. I wanted to help this poor girl so badly, but deep down, we both knew there was nothing I could actually do to keep her safe. But I told her the meal was on me, and I took her back to my house. It was still light out after all, so I figured it was safe. I let her take a long shower helped bandage up her arms, made her dinner, and introduced her to my cat. And then I cut up some fruit and placed it in Tupperware containers along with some cookies. And I gave her directions to the nearest motel. I still think about that girl all the time. It's been half a decade, and I haven't heard anything about her since. I don't know if she was killed by that thing, or if she managed to outrun it but I still pray every single night that one of these days she'll walk back into my diner and tell me the story of how she defeated that monster over more waffles covered with way too much powdered sugar and a side of fruit. <laughs>